Hi, my name is Kevin Price. I'm pleased to be with you today to talk about the spotted bee balm proposed medicinal plant spoken of in Alma 4640. The, uh, the scientific name is Monarda punctata or punctata. Um, it was named by Carl von Linnaeus, uh, which is why the L is there at the end. And I was a professor in the Department of Geography at um, several universities, and I was a professor in agronomy. I'll explain more detail in a little bit later. <clears throat> A little background on myself. I grew up in a really small town, a little town called Green River, Utah. Some of you who live in Utah may be familiar with this little town. It's down by the cities of Price and Moab, down near the Canyonlands area, and um, they're quite famous for their watermelons. So I grew up there from the time I was four months old until I went away on my mission and then off to college. I did my bachelor's and master's degree in the Department of Botany and Range Science at Brigham Young University, and my PhD was just up the road in Salt Lake. Um, there I did my PhD in geography, and my specialty was in biogeography, which is basically ecology, remote sensing and geographic information systems. After graduating from the University of Utah, I took a job at Utah State University, where I love being there at Utah State. Um, I taught there for three years. I didn't have access to graduate students. As a, the program I was in did not have a graduate program. I was recruited away by the University of Kansas and went there in 1989. <clears throat> and taught there and did research until 2008. I was a full professor. I was the associate director of the Kansas Applied Remote Sensing Program for 16 years. And then I got recruited away from KU. Um, some of you may familiar, I'll go back to KU. If you're into basketball, you know that KU is well respected in its basketball history. The man who invented basketball was the first basketball coach at the University of Kansas. Um, I wanted to get back to my agricultural roots. I grew up on a farm and working on the ranch there on the Santa Fe soil. My grandfather ran, ran uh, about a thousand head of cattle on Bureau of Land Management lands and so I grew up with a love of nature and um, and really love the uh, farming and agricultural areas. So <clears throat> I was asked if I'd be interested in teaching at Kansas State University and so I uh, accepted a position there in the Department of Agronomy. Some of you may not be familiar with that term. Agronomy is the field that where people work in uh, soils and crops, working with testing different crop types, working on genetic varieties that that are improved genetic varieties and so on. And I was the director of the Ecology and Agricultural Statistic, Statistical Analysis Laboratory there at Kansas State University. I taught there for six years and then I was recruited away by the private sector and worked in the area of drones. <clears throat> in fact, this next picture that I got Got started at K-State working with a lot of drone research, um, mainly not in flying the drones. I, I am a licensed pilot uh, by the FAA, but um, my interest there was in capturing the photography from the drones <clears throat> and using that to study the crops. And so I worked on uh, genetic breeding, I worked in disease detection, biomass predictions, and so on using drones. And I was one of the first to get involved in that. I started in 2011. And because I was so early into the field, I got invited to speak all over the world on the topic of drones in agriculture and natural resource management. I spoke at over 100 conferences around the world as a keynote or invited speaker. So <clears throat> down here in the bottom corner, you see me uh, at a conference where I'd spoke. Um, you see all the reporters here on this one as we were teaching them about what we can do with the drones. That's me um, in the purple shirt 
that's got the gray hair and my colleague Dion Thandemerva <clears throat> holding a, a fixed wing drone and these are all the news organizations and what you don't see here is this is only one third of them the line went back at least two-thirds longer than what you're seeing in this picture that's how much interest there was in some of the early work we we're doing in drones now <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> I want to expose my biases that way you'll know where I'm coming from when I talk about different things and won't be trying to guess I'm not gonna make you guess I'm gonna tell you exactly first off I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I was born into the church. I was baptized when I was eight. And um, my great-grandparents on both sides came across the plains with Brigham Young. So <clears throat> I've got a pioneer heritage. And um, my wife's side of the family also has a, a strong pioneer heritage. And um, so both of us were have lots of roots in the church um, as a result it wouldn't be in the church if you didn't believe that Joseph Smith was a prophet and I believe that all subsequent prophets that came were called by God that came after Joseph Smith I believe that Joseph Smith was instructed by heavenly visitors as to the Book of Mormon peoples and he knew where they lived I was taught for 40 years by BYU professors or the work of BYU professors and church educators that the Book of Mormon events transpired in Mesoamerica. For some reason to me this never really rang true. I, however, I always believe that Nephi and other Book of Mormon prophets were describing the United States, not southern Mexico, not Guatemala. Example when he talked about people coming across the ocean uh, who were led by God, I believe that was Columbus. When he talks about the people who came seeking religious freedom, I believe that was the pilgrims. When he talks about the land of liberty, I believe he's talking about the United States of America. I do not see a Statue of Liberty in Guatemala. <clears throat> he talks about the promised land. I believe he's talking about the United States or the, it could be Southern Canada, um, the United States it could even be some of southern Mexico but I believe it's the North American part of the United States not the Mesoamerica <clears throat> the but one of the challenges I had was where were all the artifacts where were the structures the buildings and so on like we see in Mesoamerica that would indicate there was this great and advanced culture that lived here in America well um, I kept wondering where that was because I never could find this feeling that Mesoamerica was the right place. I'll come back to that in just a second. Now, I grew up working on the ranch. Um, I worked in a gas station as a kid and I even worked in the uranium mines as a dynamiter and driller and ore buggy operator. Um, that's probably why I decided to get my PhD after working in the uranium mines. I decided there's got to be a better way to make a living. <coughs> I was a professor for 27 years and so I worked in the great and spacious building and so I know all about that great and spacious building um, now coming back to the Mesoamerica um, question finally several years ago I watched a video on YouTube it was by Wayne May and the title of it was Book of Mormon Geography in North America and I knew then there was overwhelming evidence to support the Heartland Book of Mormon geography model. In other words, these people who were here, the, the Nephites were living in the Heartland region, primarily in the Heartland of the United States, not down in Guatemala and not in Mesoamerica or South, Southern Mexico. To continue with the biases, I want you to know that my testimony of the Book of Mormon is not based upon geography. Um, it shouldn't be. It should be based upon a testimony of the Spirit telling us that it's true. But to those who say that geography is unimportant, 
I tell them as one with a PhD in geography that they are very uninformed <clears throat> and let me explain why geographers term places without geographic location as placeless and such fall into the category of fairy tales and fables sound familiar what do our critics say about the Book of Mormon when the Book of Mormon lands are displayed on a map that some of us call a fantasy map it's not reality we're telling our youth and we're telling our critics that the Book of Mormon is a fairy tale so while we may have spiritual testimonies of the Book of Mormon most of our youth and non-member friends often do not yet have this spiritual witness and will be reluctant to read and pray about a fairy tale would you ask a friend to pray about Jack and the Beanstalk I mean this is just absolutely crazy that we're showing the Book of Mormon on a fantasy map it's sending a signal that the Book of Mormon is phony it's fake it's a fairy tale <clears throat> and it's not I know it is not fake I know it is not phony but we seem to be doing our best to try to help our critics by convincing them that <clears throat> It is a fairy tale because we have put the geography of the Book of Mormon on a phony map. <clears throat> we must make it clear that we reject such a depiction of the Book of Mormon and will not allow the events of the Book of Mormon to be betrayed, to be portrayed as only metaphors. The <clears throat> people have gone to trying to say that the story of the Garden of Eden is a metaphor what they do not understand is if Adam and Eve didn't exist then when we look at the genealogy of Jesus Christ in the book of Luke and it goes all the way back to Adam it's impossible for Christ to have existed because Adam and Eve didn't exist he had no parents it just it's just craziness <clears throat> so I do not I believe Adam and Eve were literal and I believe the Book of Mormon was literal and we need to not be giving our critics all this ammunition to undermine the integrity and sacredness of the book Satan is having a heyday with depicting this very real and sacred book we must stop it remember the parable of the talents the servant who was afraid and hid the talent and never gained anything because he hid the talent was chastised by the Lord and his talent was taken away and given to someone else based on the message of this parable I believe saying we are afraid to speak up is not going to go over well with the Lord my mission president was Elder Rex C Reeves and I remember when he got into the mission he said to us in the zone in our zone meetings I zone meetings I do not want any mealy-mouthed Mormon missionaries in this mission and I'm sure the Lord concurred all right so let's get started with some of the geography where is the ancient city of Zarahemla it's right where God told us it is and let's not mess around with scripture let here it is it's in Doctrine and Covenants 125 verse 3 let them build up a city unto my name upon the land opposite the city of Nauvoo and let the name of Zarahemla be placed upon it that's revelation given to Joseph Smith recorded in the Doctrine and Covenants God told us where Zarahemla is so some would say well this does not mean that the ancient city of Zarahemla was across the river from Nauvoo then my question to them is then what did God mean by telling Joseph Smith to name it Zarahemla remember when he told him where the new Jerusalem was going to be not the old Jerusalem what did he call it new Jerusalem so why didn't God tell Joseph Smith to call the city on the other side that he was to name why did he tell him to call it new Zarahemla he didn't and that's because it was not the new Zarahemla it was where Zarahemla was located and so I when I ask people this question why did God tell him to call it that I've never gotten an answer yet and let's hope they 
do not believe God made a mistake when I'm talking about the critics who say that this doesn't mean that Zarahemla was on the opposite side of the river and by the way the name of the river we call it the Mississippi it's called the River Sidon in the Book of Mormon and I'll get to that too just a minute as I'm getting into the the plant that I want to introduce you to well let's hope they do not believe the Lord made a mistake in calling this, the area across the river Zarahemla or that Joseph Smith made it up. Throwing the Lord or Joseph Smith under the bus is not an answer I can accept. My experience has shown me that when I listen to God, he blesses me with increased knowledge and wisdom. If I share what I learn with others, he blesses me with even greater knowledge and insights. Why would God want to give us a bunch of insights if we're afraid to share it with anyone else? <clears throat> it's just going to be dead on the vine if we don't get out and open our mouths and talk about it. I'm about to share with you new knowledge. It's not very old, but it's exciting. We have gained a, a new knowledge about the ancient people that modern-day archaeologists call the Hopewell culture, the Hopewell people, whom many of us believe were the Nephites. Um, uh, and they were the ones who did the building. The Lamanites were obviously there at the same time, but they weren't the, they weren't the builders and the agriculturists. Now, as a young boy, I remember reading the Book of Mormon, and I remember coming to this section in Alma 4640, and, I, and I'm not making this up because I definitely remember this, and in a minute I'll explain why I remember it. And this is what it says in Alma 4640, and there were some who died with fevers, which at some, time, uh, which at some seasons of the year, notice I've got that highlighted, some seasons of the year, were very frequent in the land, but not so much so with fevers because of the excellent quality of the many plants and roots which God had prepared to remove the cause of diseases to which men were subject by the nature of the climate. In other words, the diseases that Alma's talking about here are diseases that come and go depending upon the time of year, the season of the year. Did you ever wonder, as I did, to which plant Alma was referring? I have always had a great love of plants. And I'll tell you, I'll deviate here for a second. Even as a young boy, I loved plants. My grandma, my grandfather and grandmother gave me a quarter acre of garden lot for me when I was 12 years old and I was growing a full-size garden in a quarter acre area <clears throat> as a 12 year old. And when I got into scouting, I remember we were up at Camp Mapledale there in Utah and <clears throat> They took us out in the woods and taught us the common names of a bunch of plants. Well, I already knew a lot of the common names, but I learned some more when I was there. Then they pulled together all the troops, and I don't remember how many there were. There were dozens of troops there, and they had a competition. They said, we want all the troops to send their scouts out into the woods and for two minutes collect as many plants as they can and come back within two minutes and be able to name the plant. After I came back, after two minutes, I was able to collect and name more plants than all the other troops combined. That's how much I love plants and learned the plants. So when I say I was curious, I'm not just making that up. I was curious, what plants were they? <clears throat> But before I discuss the plant I believe Alma was referring to, let's discuss plants used by the Israelites and what was used for the law of Moses. I would do this to build a foundation to help you realize why, why the Nephites would have recognized the plant that I'm going to introduce you to when they saw it. And let's first talk about the amazing family of plants that God gave us for m many medicinal purposes. Now, m many plants in many families are medicinal, but there's one family that stands out above all the rest. And that one is the mint family. Um, the family name is Lamiaceae. And so when we talk about plants in the Lamiaceae family, we're talking about mints. 
and there's a, probably going to be some on this list that you'll see um, and I'm just going to give you as, as few of them there's many many more as you'll see in a minute but for example sage that you may cook with and basil which some of you may cook with to make Italian seasons and peppermint for making uh, your favorite gum or flavoring or even maybe uh, um, peptobismol, whichever, we flavor. Peppermint mints have been used to settle people's stomachs for decades or for centuries. And rosemary that you may use to cook with. Uh, some others, thyme and oregano and lavender. And here is one that you haven't heard of yet. We'll talk more about that spotted bee balm. We'll get back to that one in a bit. Now, how do you recognize a mint? Many of you have planted them, maybe in your yard as ornamentals. Um, you may have grown them for their medicinal value. But a mint is easy to pick out because if you roll the stem in your fingers, it's square. It's got four sides to it. And if you look at the leaves, the leaves branch on that square stem opposite one another. So here's the leaf and right off, right on the other side of the stem is another leaf. If you go up or down to the next leaf, they will be oriented um, um, by 90 degrees or actually, yeah, well, let's see. <clears throat> well, yeah, 90 degrees. They'll be um, oriented 90 degrees and they will be opposite those. So they alternate in the way they come up the stem opposite of one another but they alternate which direction they orient on the stem as you go up now another thing most of the blooms on mints are what we call bilateral um, symmetrical blossoms so this is the blossom that I've zoomed in on and see I've drawn a dashed line through there and it's showing how that I can take this side and fold it over and it'll match this side. They match one another along the, the, the major axis of the, the blossom. And so that's called bilateral symmetry. So if you find those, you're holding a mint in your hand or you're looking at a mint. Now, to give you an idea, the mint family is one of the largest families among the plants, but I will say there are families that are much larger than the mint. Here we've got about 7,200 species of mints in the world. If you were to look at the number of species in the sunflower family, also called the compositae family, there's over 300,000 sunflowers in the world. Um, that are in the sunflower. Some of you live out there in Utah that may be watching this. Um, you may be surprised to learn that big sagebrush is in the sunflower family. So there's plants that don't look anything like a sunflower that are in the sunflower family. Um, there are 200 genera in this Lamiaceae family or the mint family. And many of the plants in this family have great economic importance. For example, they are used because they're ornamental. They're beautiful flowers to look at. As you see the plant on your right, that's a mint. Notice the limbs are opposite one another. The stem, you can't tell really well, but it's square and so on. It's not quite as pronounced on the bisymmetry on the blossom here, but um, if we had a good angle, you can see you could run a line here and it'd be bisymmetrical. They are used for flavoring of lots and lots of different flavors come from the mint family. And they have beautiful aromas or they can have strong aromas that come from the essential oils that are produced by this plant. Many oils come from the mint family and essential oils are basically the second their um, metabolites that come off of plants. We'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. And the mint family has many medicinal properties because they're loaded quite often with monoterpenoids and phenols. All right, I'm going to show you some examples of, of why they're beautiful ornamentally, but also be, um, we'll get into talking about medicinally as well. So here's thyme. You see, that wouldn't be a bad one to have in your garden, would it? Or lavender. People grow lavender all the time in their gardens. Uh, just over at uh, 
one of the department stores or the box stores here in town and they had lavender they were selling for people to plant in their yard and basil you see it's got some pretty pink flowers and and rosemary you see the bilateral on that one look if i drew a line right up through there you could see that as plain as day rosemary and here's sage now here's one that is not used for cooking or essential oils but is strictly ornamental and probably some of you have grown this it's called coleus next time you buy coleus to plant put your fingers on the stem look at the opposite branches and so on and you'll know that you're looking at a mint it's in the mint family now here's some that are medicinal I'll just read them real quick there's rosemary lemon balm bee balm uh, oregano peppermint catnip thyme lavender and sage um, the website here you can go to if you want to pause this and go find those things on the website you can learn more there's lots of places you can find this but herbal remedies <clears throat> now <clears throat> let's get to what we see in Jerusalem and I've only picked two examples of literally dozens and dozens of examples of mints growing there. But why these two? Mainly this one that's white up at the top called <coughs> Syrian Marjum. And <coughs> the reason being is that Bible scholars believe this was the plant that was being referred to when the Bible refers to the hyssop plant. And we see that it was used by the people in um, the Hebrew background, those who came from uh, <clears throat> Egypt and escaped Pharaoh. There was a, a steep tradition among them. Let's read a little bit about that. David asked God to cleanse him with hyssop. The hyssop plant was used in the first Passover in Egypt to mark the Israelites' home with the blood of the Passover lamb or goat, Exodus 12, 21 through 23. In other words, they used it almost like a brush. They dipped it in the blood and then they used it to mark their doors so that they would be passed over by the destroying angel. It was also used by them in ritual cleaning and purification. Example, after the individual recovered from a skin infection, probably leprosy, and after a home was cleansed from mildew. Now, some have wondered if this was the plant. Majority of them believe this one up here, the white one, is the plant. And I honestly don't know. If the specialists don't know, then I don't know either. <clears throat> but I'm going to lean towards this one based on what I read. Now, I'm not going to read all this, but I just want to show you I've highlighted the word hyssop in each of these verses in Exodus and Leviticus and Leviticus and Leviticus, Leviticus, Leviticus. The word hyssop shows up whenever they're doing cleansing. And here it is in Numbers and Numbers and First Kings and Psalms. And then we get down here. And we see that the sponge that was put to Jesus Christ's lips when he was on the cross was dangled from a stem or a stalk of a hyssop plant. And we see in Hebrew when Moses was claimed, had claimed every command or proclaimed every command of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, sacred wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scrolls and all the people with the blood and the water, probably. And so <clears throat> we see in Hebrews again, the hyssop in the New Testament, two places are, is mentioned. And you can find more about that at this link down here. Um, the calves, some of you may have heard of the legend of the red heifer. Um, I believe when you're referring to the calves here, you're referring to the red heifer legend, but I, I'm not sure. All right, so I want to show you that this plant was very critical to the law of Moses. So if you didn't have a plant that was like this, then it would be more difficult to practice the law of Moses. And we read, <clears throat> um, I got some text from Melissa Tellick. Um, a friend of mine, she sent me some that talk about other places that talk about the healing of the plants. For example, 
Uh, I just read you Alma 46, 40, so I won't reread that one. We read in Genesis and Abraham, the Lord made every plant before it was in the earth. And in Ezekiel, we learn that the leaf of the plant is for medicine. We learn that the aromatic plant produces products, the aromatic plant products, in other words, those that have an aroma, and the ones that are most aromatic are those in the mint family. Plants produced were traded in the market. And so you can imagine there were people who were growing the hyssops so they could put them in the market so before Passover, people living in Jerusalem could buy the hyssop plants they needed in order to be um, in order to prepare for the night when they um, remembered and celebrated the Passover. Moses told us to use spices as ingredients in holy anoint anointment oils, myrrh, uh, cassia, uh, which is like cinnamon, and cinnamon were mentioned. In Psalms we read aromatic plants used to scent garments and palaces. And in the DNC, uh, obviously the Word of Wisdom and other places we learn that herbs are to be used for the benefit of man. And I don't think it's just talking about for food, it's talking about for medicinal purposes. So, the hyssop is in the Holy Land. Notice again the opposite branches, the square stem, and so on. As important as hyssop or mint, uh, the mint were to the Mosaic law and rituals associated with the law, does it make sense that the Lord would lead Lehi and his family to a land where they had no access to the plants that they needed for celebrating or going and um, living the law of Moses. Plant types are strongly influenced by climate and climate is strongly influenced by latitude, where you are north or south on the planet. Um, how far are you from the equator? Or how far are you from the North Pole? Latitude influences climate very strongly. Plant types and climate greatly influence the animal types also that live in a region. Do you think the Lord therefore might lead Lehi and his family to a region of the earth where they could grow plant seeds they brought with them from Jerusalem? I think so. Makes sense to me. Well, what is the latitude of Jerusalem? It's 71 point, or excuse me, it's 31.7 degrees. Keep that number in mind, 31.7 degrees. Let's find out where that hits in our part of the world, right there. Here's Florida down here, and here is the 71 point, excuse me, 31.7 degree latitude line. And guess what? The oldest Hopewell site in America is found right about where that dot is, right there. It's only 156 miles from the 31.7 degree latitude. And if I went straight up, it's even closer. Now, the reason I came over here is because there's an interesting trail along here called the Hopewell Trail. And there's plants that grow along that trail that I'm going to show you in a minute. So here is... Um, some of those, uh, this is actually the same mound from do, two different angles, but this is the earliest um, mounds associated with the Hopewell com uh, communities in North America. The earliest Hopewell communities are found in northern Florida. Archaeologists have determined that the Crystal River, Florida site was the first settled by Hopewell people, and when did they settle? Around 2,500 years ago, or which would be, the, they're dating these areas to about 479 BC. Now, you would have to have a lot of more people than just a small family to build a mound like this. So that the mounds that are dated to this time. So the people who built them would have lived in this area longer. Remember that Lehi left Jerusalem about 600 BC and he got to the promised land at about 590 BC, sometime around then. 
So <clears throat> here's that I just told you. Now, remember when they got there, they were thrilled because it was a paradise. Well, this is what the Crystal River area looks like even today with all our modern day pollution and contamination. It still looks like paradise. Um, this, the waters are crystal clear. They've got all kinds of vegetation and plants and so on growing in the area. So this is the Crystal River area that archaeologists say is the area where the Hopewell first came into North America. What, uh, let's go back here and yep, yeah, I guess it's not going to let me go back. I'm going to pause it. <clears throat> well, I'm going to go back and show you that this Hopewell site is in the Gulf of Mexico, part of the ocean, and they landed on the west side of Florida. Some people say that that Lehigh and his family landed on a western side of the continent. Well, they could have very easily have landed on the west side of the, the peninsula called Florida. In an earlier slide, I talked about the importance of the plant hyssop to the Israelites. During my presentation on spotted bee balm as the proposed plant that Lehi and his family used after coming to the Promised Land for medicinal and mosaic law rituals, I presented the spotted bee balm as a possible replacement for hyssop used by the Israelites at Passover and for that ritual cleaning. It is possible even that Lehi sold this plant in the marketplace to the Israelites. As one practicing the law of Moses, he would be very familiar with the plant hyssop. I asked Betty and Mike LaFontaine for pictures of the spotted bee balm that they took in Florida in the northeast part of the state. Also, this area is sometimes referred to as the Hopewell Trail because there's so much evidence of Hopewell living in the area. Anyway, Betty sent me <clears throat> mostly close-up pictures, as you see below on the left. But then she sent me one full picture, plant picture, as you see below on the right. It's the, pit, it's the plant here in the center. Let's see if I can show you that right in here right here <clears throat> I'm trying to get the right tool here now I showed you this slide earlier I wanted to again confirm that hyssop was very important to the Israelites and it would have been important to Lehi when he arrived here in the Americas to have a plant that would serve the role of hyssop as it did for the Feast of the Passover in being able to dip the, the uh, ends of the plant in the blood of the lamb and mark the doorposts with the blood. <clears throat> but also it was used as a ritual cleaning for people who had skin infections. I'm presuming that might be leprosy. So um, we're not sure which of the plants here is the hyssop that was used, but most Bible scholars lean towards this one at the top, the um, marjoram. Now, why is this important? <clears throat> well, um, some of you may be familiar with the program called Google Lens. Google Lens is a program, it's primarily suited for those who use the Android software. <clears throat> anyway, um, I have this loaded on my Samsung smartphone and I use it from time to time to classify plants that I'm unfamiliar with. Now I may have mentioned that I'm quite familiar with a lot of plants. I was the um, plant uh, the international plant judging coach for our Brigham Young University plant judging team and took them into Canada to compete with teams all over North America and um, and I took classes where we had to learn a lot of the plants. Well, so um, you can't memorize them all. There's four, about four million different species of plants in the world. So uh, this program is real handy. You basically take a picture 
and it will go through its database of millions of pictures, maybe billions, and come back and tell you what they believe the plant is. They classify it for you. Um, it doesn't just work on plants, it works on about anything. I pointed it at my kitchen stove because I couldn't remember what the model was. It came back and told me the model and make of the stove. I pointed it at vacuum cleaners, it'll tell you what year it was produced. It's amazing. Anyway, <clears throat> to go on here, there's it's a free application you can download on your smartphone. It's called Google Lens. The program uses artificial intelligence. Uh, basically, artificial intelligence is a class classification algorithm. This is something I taught at the university level. I specialized in the classification of satellite imagery and later on drone imagery. And there's multiple ways of classifying the way artificial intelligence works in a very general explanation is it uses what we call a supervised approach. Basically you show it a picture, you tell what's in the picture, and, the, and then it analyzes the picture to look at the way it reflects light and the spatial arrangement of features in the image. It's basically looking at the topology of the image and then it will try to match what it sees in your picture with pictures from that people have posted on um, Google Drive or, or, or in their email or whatever. They're mining our data like crazy and it matches it. So when I later I'll show you I t and the next slide I'll explain how I use this to try to see how well it worked on spotted bee bomb. On a whim I pulled up the picture of the spotted bee bomb that Betty sent to me and it it always correctly classified spotted bee bomb as spotted bee bomb when I had a picture of the plant up close. So um, <clears throat> But Google Lens searches its billions of pictures found and found a plant that most looked like spotted bee bomb in Betty's picture. Now guess what Google Lens classified the spotted bee bomb as? <clears throat> well here, when I pointed it at the close-up picture I showed earlier, it said spotted bee bomb. But I planted it when I put the dot, the blue dot in Google Lens on the plant, as you see in this picture, which is looking at not the the close-ups of the bloom, so you can see the petals, but it's looking at the, what we would call in in plant studies uh, the architecture of the geometric shapes of the plant and the way the plant is arranged in its canopy. So it's classifying on a different set of criteria than when it's up close. And guess what it called it? See down here where I'm pointing? It classified it as hyssop. In other words, of the billions of pictures it looked like, this picture of spotted bee bomb was determined to look most like the plant hyssop, which is in the Holy Land. So what does that tell us? Well, in this slide, the blue dot is on what I was trying to classify. This tells us that from even a short distance, the spotted bee bomb looks like hyssop. And the Israelite, uh, which was the Israelite sacred plant used at Passover and ritual cleansing. If an artificial intelligence program that searches through billions of pictures in the cloud thinks spotted bee balm looks like hyssop, then I'm sure that when Lehi first saw the plant from a distance, he was probably thinking the same thing. He thinking, oh my word, we got hyssop growing here in the promised land. <clears throat> well, the evidence continues to build. The spotted bee bomb was growing on the Zarahemla Temple site in Iowa. That's right across the river from the um, Nauvoo Temple. And even a nursery owner who lives only a few blocks away from the temple site, um, the, the Zarahemla temple site. He says, when I asked him, he said he'd never seen the plant growing elsewhere in the area, even though he drove within a block of this plant almost probably daily as he's driving back and forth on the road that runs past his, his nursery. So he'd never seen it. <clears throat> As we drove around through the area, I watched for the plant to see if I could see it growing anywhere else. And I found it growing nowhere else except on the Zarahemla Temple site. Now, I'm not saying that it doesn't grow other places. I'm simply saying that it's not growing 
around the area where the temple site was. We didn't find it. <clears throat> it grows in Iowa. People have found it there. It just wasn't in the area where we found it um, on the temple site. The mounting evidence that we have found a plant, the Nephites in the Promised Land uses a proxy for hyssop. <clears throat> um, I think we found it. Both are in the mint family and have a similar geometric form, so it could function as hyssop did in the Holy Land. In this slide, you see some of the characteristics about the spotted bee bomb. Notice the spots that are showing up on the petals. These are the white the white features here are the petals, not the pink. The pink are bracts, which subtend petals on the plant. And the little green things in here, they're capsules. Each one holds four seeds. And <clears throat> there's hundreds of capsules around it. As the plant grows, it continues to add more bracts and layers. So it grows in layers. And it's called spotted bee balm because of the spots on the blooms. But quite often when you see the plant, it is not, um, it does not have the petals on it, but it's still showy, so people find it very attractive. Oh, by the way, there are nine subspecies of the plant, and this pinkish one is one that we find, we found in the Florida area. The one on the Zarahemla temple site is more of a cream color. It varies from light pink to yellow to white. So it's not the same. It's a different subspecies. Oh, and the, the scientific name of the plant is Monarda punctata, as was on the cover slide. Now, if you were Lehigh and you got out of your ship and got on the land and you saw this plant, would you notice it? Most people say, yeah, I sure would. It's gorgeous. Well, that is the Florida variety of the spotted bee balm. That was growing in Florida when the Hopewell were living in Florida. It's native to the North America. And one thing I'll have you notice is that these pink people say, oh, those are petals. Those are not the petals. Those are the bracts. And bracts subtend the blooms or just under. Here's the bloom up here, and this is the brack. So this plant, after the bloom fades, the brack stays. This plant stays showy for the entire growing season. It's an amazing perennial that would make great landscaping plant, but we're going to talk about its medicinal values here in a bit. Here's another picture also taken in Florida. You can see there's quite a bit of variation in the brightness of the bloom. Some are pale pink, some are, <clears throat> when we get into the Zarahemla site, they're cream colored and white, and some are light pink. But you see this beautiful specimen down here. These pictures were given to me, the pictures before I just showed you, and these pictures were given to me by Betty and Mike LaFontaine, who live there in Florida, and they went out and started finding this after we discovered it on the Zarahemla temple site. Notice now, the blooms are dried up and brown up here. It's the bracts of the showy part of the plant. So even after it's finished blooming, it's still an attractive plant. All right, so the... <clears throat> This is a map that was printed in 1894 by Cyrus Thomas, and this was held in the Smithsonian um, there in Washington, D.C. And every red dot represents a general location of where they have found the mounds built by the people that are called Hopewell. They're called Hopewell because they first did some of the early work on them on a farmer's land, and his name was Hopewell. So <clears throat> you can see they're following the Mississippi River tributaries. Here's the Mississippi coming down into Louisiana and draining into the Gulf of Mexico. But it goes right up into the Great Lakes region. And you can see that they're following these tributaries staying close mostly to where they've got good access to transportation the the rivers were their freeways back at the time of the book of mormon 
So keep that in mind. I'm going to show you some more things um, that tie into this. Well, here <clears throat> I put a star by four different locations where people who knew that we were talking about this plant quite a bit said, hey, I've got this growing in my area. And the plant does grow throughout many places in the hope in the, excuse me in the heartland of the United States and you can find it in Texas and people have moved it into other places such as California and all that but it's been it wasn't growing there naturally it was transplanted out there and what you're seeing here is where the stars are where people said we've got hopewell growing in our basically in our town right here those are all places where we also found Hopewell. So every place so far where we found the spotted bee palm, we've also found Hopewell. Now, we're just getting started. We've got a lot more work to do. Okay, now let's go to our next slide. And what I want to show you, I'm going to take you now to Iowa, across the river from Nauvoo. And people say, well, if the Nephites live there, is there any evidence? If you haven't seen the evidence, trust me, it is everywhere. And <clears throat> this is just three mounds that are right there in the Nauvoo, um, Montrose. Montrose is the opposite side of the river from Nauvoo, you may remember when the saints crossed the river on the ice heading towards Utah, most of them crossed and got out at Montrose. You'll also remember that there were members of the church who were there that were so poor they didn't have the resources to continue on and they were starving and the Lord sent quails. Well, the quails came to those people while they were in this area called Montrose. Well, these are Nephite mounds, or they could be Jaredite. The Jaredites are in this area as well. Um, geologists, or excuse me, archaeologists call them a Dina culture. And um, the Nephites, they call them Hopewell, as I was just saying. So <clears throat> there's both Hopewell and Adina, or I'm going to call them Nephites and Jaredites, mounds in this area. And these are all either burial mounds or they're ritual mounds for for uh, temples or for other purposes. And if you want to know a lot more about these, Wayne May has some great videos out there on YouTube you can watch. But I want to show you now. I want to show you the next one is really close to Zarahemla. It's about a 15-minute drive, and here is our two cars parked right here at the foot of this and it's called the Little Mound Cemetery and what we have uh, is Jaredites on the bottom, Nephites in the middle and Europeans on top. This is a modern day grave uh, cemetery. Well, we flew this with a drone and here every little blue square is where the drone acquired a picture. So some of the areas you can see got a little too far apart and as long as there's some overlap, you can build what's called a, a three-dimensional model. Um, we use a technique called structure from motion when we're using area photography. This one, they got a little far apart right here, so it left a gap. That gray patch is where the pictures weren't close enough together to build a good, um, have good tie points that are needed to build the ortho. But for the most part, it was pretty. It turned out pretty good. And the software that I use to generate this allows you to spin this and look at it in 3D, zoom in, zoom out, all kinds of cool things. But anyway, that gives you an idea how big some of these mounds are. I'm going to take you to the Zarahemla temple site. And some people cringe when I call it the temple site. I'm calling it the temple site. And the reason I'm calling it is because we believe that this area is where the ancient uh, Zarahemla temple was located. And I've drawn a little rectangle approximately in the area where the temple would have been located. And so. <clears throat> Across the river, there, that little white dot over there, that is the Nauvoo Temple. 
and we look over in here there's a little town of Montrose that we talked about and probably <clears throat> a lot of their hemla is now covered with buildings from Montrose We've been in here and done magnetometer work. Uh, we went out on the river last August with sonar. We found where Alma would have walked his army of about 80,000 soldiers <clears throat> across the river to stop the um, uh, Amlicites from attacking Zarahemla. They were really close and they had to rush across the river in order to protect the people from being attacked. Well, there's two or three places on the river between here and Keokuk, Iowa, where you could walk across that river and probably not get in water much deeper than your knees. Now, it's not that way now because they built the dam there at Keokuk, and this is a lake. <clears throat> but before that lake was built, Joseph Smith rode his horse across the river, um, right there from Nauvoo across the river over to Montrose. And <clears throat> people would actually bet that they could walk across the Mississippi River without getting their shoes wet at certain times of the year. So this is an area that was a natural stopping point for people because they couldn't get ships or Nephite um, uh, boats further up the river because the river was too shallow. And so this area here became the great city of Zarahemla and we find thousands of arrowheads, battle axes, hardened copper, all kinds of things um, that tell you, and they all date to the time of the Book of Mormon. So if you want to, you could call the Mississippi River the River Sidon. <clears throat> and I know some people say, wait a minute, <clears throat> the Mississippi flows south and the Book of Mormon says it flows north. Well, <clears throat> ask those people to show you where in the Book of Mormon it says it flows north because they won't be able to find it. Um, some people based on some pretty, um, well, they were using assumptions based on things that they thought they were right on and assumed that it flows north based upon things that they were reading. We knew it, we know it flew, flows either north or south because they talk about west bank and east banks on the river, Sidon. But we know that the river Sidon flows south, obviously, because the Mississippi flows south. But the Mississippi is the Sidon River. And, and if you'll ask them to show you where it says it flows north in the Book of Mormon, they won't be able to show it to you. What they'll do is in the 1988 edition of the Book of Mormon, in the index it says that it flows north. That was because of some some assumptions that were made that have since been proven false and now it in the next edition of the Book of Mormon that will no longer be in the Book of Mormon it won't indicate the direction that it flows so you're welcome to say it flows south if you want you'll be in safe territory now what are we looking at here you see there's a if you look you can see this a little rise area this is where this plant called the spotted bee bomb was growing abundantly on the temple site. Um, you see this rectangular area around here? That is modern. So don't try to tie anything to that because what happened is that um, the people who owned the land before it was bought, um, they planted what they call um, conservation reserve program grasses and forbs. And then they would mow just this area in here to hay it. So it's different than the area right next to it. They weren't mowing the areas around the edge because they had a lot of debris that would break their mowing machine. So they just mowed the center part. But the temple sitting right over in here. And if you want uh, last last conference, I did a paper on the scientific evidence is supporting the location of that site. Uh, you might find that interesting to watch. All right, so the bee bomb is growing right here. And how do we find it? Well, Wayne and I, my two, two of my sister-in-laws, my wife and my daughter and their, her family met here and Wayne drove down from Wisconsin to Iowa and gave us a tour of the area. Um, we also got beautiful tours by the Curleys who took us to uh, the Hill Omnehu and 
Cal Christensen took us all over the region showing us a lot of amazing sites. You want to see some really cool stuff. <clears throat> we There is stuff here that would just blow your mind. Um, but anyway, um, this area here, Wayne was giving us a tour and we came down to this location and we parked and we're talking and Wayne says, what is this plant that's growing right here? And I looked at it and I thought, you know, I've never seen that plant before. I don't remember ever seeing it. And that's saying something because I spent a lot of my early parts of my career doing field work and classifying plants. And um, I taught the BYU International Plant Judging Team. We had to learn thousands of plants. So I'm looking at the plant and I'm saying, I don't remember ever seeing that one. What is that one? And I reached down and picked it up and instantly I knew it was a mint. I said to Wayne, Wayne, this is a mint. I said, look, square stems, opposite leaves. And I said, now I'll bet if I crush the leaves, you'll smell a strong odor coming from it, an aroma. And crushed them and sure enough, it was really pungent. And so when I got back to the hotel room that night, I, I keyed it out and it was Monarda punctata or spotted bee balm. Now, I thought, you know, that plant, um, it's in the mint family. Here it is. Here's the berm I was pointing at. And we were parked down there by the trees, and it was growing very abundantly all over here. It was also growing in patches out in the, the field. And this is the close-up of the bee balm plant. Notice it's not in bloom. So this doesn't look very showy because the blooms are all gone but it's kind of a creamish green color and the color changes throughout the growing season it seems but this gives you an idea of what it looks like and so we started looking at the more i looked the more i realized that it had some potential medicinal value so in august um i got a hold of my brother-in-law and i'll fully disclose this um because I don't want people thinking that I'm trying to make money off of this, because I'm not. Uh, I've not made a dime and don't plan on making any money off of it. But <clears throat> my, my complete objective here is to try and help verify things that are in the Book of Mormon. What we did, and this is a picture of Mike LaFontaine helping us, we collected 13 pounds of the plant material in August. And Danny Young, um, who is my brother-in-law, and he also runs a, an essential oils company there in Nephi, he has called um, B. Young Total Health. Um, he flew in from Utah. And we gathered this and we put it on ice and he flew it back the next morning um, and took it straight to his, his office and put the, all the material in a big, um, big vat that allowed him to extract the essential oils using steam distillation techniques. And he extracted the oils from the plant within less than 24 hours after it was collected. And here is a, the, the beaker sort of thing that it was, um, it's, um, it's a beaker that's used to collect the oils are floating on top of the hydrosol. The hydrosol is basically water, but it's loaded with essential oil um, elements. The essential oils are right here. The hydrosols are down here. And you can just, you can just open a little spigot and drain off the water until you get to the oil and then stop it and then pour the oil out and then you got the two separated so we did that and this actually doesn't show the one that was this was a second batch we did with um, a plant from florida but the first one we did from iowa it was about four times more oil than we're seeing here <clears throat> now the plants that are the plants produce what's called a secondary metabolite. And here's where it's like little glands that secrete the oils. And basically what this is, is the plants insecticides or the plants oils that make it so that animals don't like the taste of it or it makes it sticky so they get stuck in it if they touch it. 
all different types of things that the plants use these uh, secondary metabolites these are the little spikes on there are called trichromes and when you distill it what you're doing is getting these little droplets to evaporate and go into solution and then well they're in the steam and then when you condense it this comes back out and you can separate the, the, the different chemicals and then we sent the, the essential oil to the leading laboratory in the world on essential oils. It's there in Lehigh, Utah. It used to be out here in the central part of the U.S. and they relocated and they're there in Lehigh. So Dana drove the oils from Nephi to Lehigh and turned them in and they did the gas chromatograph mass spectrometry work on the oils. And when Dana went back to pick the report up he wanted to pick it up in person the person who did the analysis came out to meet him he said I want to what he said what is this plant and Dana told him it's called spotted bee bomb he said where did you get this <laughs> he, he said out in, in uh, Iowa he said this plant is loaded with essential oils. It is the most powerful plant we've ever tested in our laboratory in terms of medicinal oils that are of value for medicinal purposes. And so <clears throat> we got the report. The plant has 56 compounds in it. <clears throat> and we're listing the 10 top, the 10 highest compounds. And here was the gas chromatograph um, mass spec report and 56 compounds notice that carvacrol was the number one and then other ones and i'm not going to sit and read them but i want to point out the carvacrol and the thymol because i'm going to show you some scientific research about these chemicals now when we did the chemical analysis on the plant in florida it was flipped the thymol was higher and the carvacrol was lower so the subspecies really makes a difference in the chemical constituencies of the plant this is the there hemla plant and by the way that chemist he when he analyzed this sample and he analyzed the one that we had from florida that mike um, lafontaine and betty collected for us and then three other samples were sent in from I don't know where um, probably people hearing about this and decide they're going to check it out themselves he said whatever it is he said the one that you've got on the Iowa sample site hang on to it it's more powerful than any of the others we've tested so <clears throat> what do we have here here is a so I'm going to be citing journal articles in medical journals. This is the Journal of Pharmacy and Pharmacology. The effects of carvacrol, thymol, and essential oils. And they found it to be an extremely powerful antibiotic. And I'm not going to go and obviously read the abstracts and all, but they're there. Um, you should be able to find these by just searching on the title and all that if you want to find them. Some of them I put the link in. I may have, it looks like I forgot to put the link on this one. But, but so you see those two essential oils showing up. And what did I just show you was found in the spotted bee bomb. And we find here in the International Journal of Clinical and Experimental Pathology. This was a study that was done by the Chinese. And they tested it against some of the most highly powerful, most dangerous bacteria in the world that are antibiotic resistant. And they used oil from Monarda punctata or spotted bee bomb. And they found that it took out several of these very antibiotic resistant bacteria in a petri dish, took them out, and it found that it denatured the cell wall of some of the really bad ones and crippled them. So <clears throat> they are finding that the plant has power to protect people against this, these very powerful bacteria. And why should we be concerned about this? Because if there ever is a bacterial biological warfare that goes on, 
these potentially are some of the bacteria that will be used against us. And <clears throat> so we ought to be looking for ways. In fact, the military has been testing spotted bee bomb as a potential treatment for bacterial warfare. Now, here is another one of interest, and I'm not saying that it will cure COVID, so let's make sure you understand. I'm not saying that, um, but I am saying that the EPA approved thymol um, as a cleaner for surface cl disinfecting against COVID. So the thymol was used to wipe off the counters. You didn't need to use stinky bleach. You could use the thymol and disinfect your, your surfaces. And if I go back to that that article I just showed you a second ago, and I can't go back without stopping the video and, and moving back, so I'm going to just say this. But the what they found also when they did the studies <clears throat> is if they only use thymol on the bacteria or they only use carvacrol on the bacteria, it wasn't nearly as effective in controlling the bacterial infections as when they used the entire essential oil. So it there's a synergistic effect that takes place on these plants, um, these essential oils. And taking and just synthesizing one of the compounds is not going to be nearly as effective as using the entire essential oil. Here's another article. Thiamol is the latest natural cleanser approved by the EPA to kill COVID. And there is a link to that one. <clears throat> and now we get back to one of the reasons why I think that the neophytes living in that part of the world had this plant. It's an anti-plasmoidal or insecticidal <clears throat> activity of the essential oils in the Mediterranean was tested and the thymol enriched with other uh, compounds such as the carvacrol was very powerful in taking out malaria. And this was done in, let's see, the Mediterranean region <clears throat> They've got one also, I think the next one is in Brazil. Yep, this one's in Brazil. Treatment for malaria. They found that in this study showed evidence of the anti-malarial activities of these species for northeast Brazil. Um, I'm not sure which plants they were using, but they found what did they use? That was the, it was an essential oil and they had the thymol. You see over here highlighted. Thymol was one of the compounds that was being used. <clears throat> now, why would we be concerned with the malaria? We don't have malaria, right? Well, wrong. <clears throat> we don't have it anymore, but we had malaria infected millions of people in the United States. Uh, this is the 1970s census data, and the red areas are showing where people have died from malaria in the United States back in the late 1800s. Nauvoo is sitting right about there. Now those of you who know something about the history of the early saints when they went into commerce, which later, later got changed to Nauvoo, it was a swampland. And guess what the number one killer of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints was in Nauvoo? It was malaria. <laughs> and it killed them between July and December. I remember they get infected when the mosquitoes are out. In the Mesoamerica region, the mosquitoes can affect you with malaria year round. It is not a seasonal disease, but it creates a great fever. Malaria is a makes you really hot. And I know firsthand, I had a colleague just about died on me in Africa who was infected with malaria. I got him into the hospital just before he died, only hours or he'd have been dead. And he was so hot, you could hardly touch him. And that's a whole story in and of itself. But <clears throat> the, the fever is terrible. And People who die from it often die because um, notice they're dying clear into December, and that's because the the virus or the, the the parasite can stay in their bloodstream for years, and they can have reoccurrences of the kind of flares up on them. Um, <clears throat> many members lost their lives because of this. So what were the neophytes using spotted beef bomb for? To treat the fever. The fever was malaria. 
<clears throat> here we are we're collecting we wanted to grow this plant and see where we can get it to grow we went out last um, I think it was late October early November and we collected seeds um, we had Native Americans who were very interested in it and came over to help us and um, these young women were involved with the group that were Native Americans. Uh, they sang Native American songs as they thrashed the seed. They did a blessing on the site um, and they helped a great deal in collecting these seeds. And so when we got them collected here is the container of the seeds. They're really really small and um, I hadn't got them completely cleaned yet. I needed to run them through a sieve so there's a little bit of, of chaff in here still <clears throat> but eventually I got it almost completely clean and volumetrically I estimated we had 600 around 600,000 seeds we've been sending to people all over the United States who want them if any of you want them um, send me an email message my email will be at the end of this uh, the end of this talk and and give me I'll uh, give me your uh, mailing address if you'd send me a a self-addressed stamped envelope that would help and get it back to you a lot quicker and um, I will send you some seeds but you see I've got them sitting on top of a, a $20 bill here and next to a ruler the seeds are about one millimeter in size when you go to germinate them the way we germinate them was uh, we took equal parts of sand and peat moss and mixed it together and dampened it just barely damp not wet and mix the seeds in with it and when the seeds start germinating they're so small you almost need a microscope to see them here you can see it germinating I've zoomed in a little I use my cell phone camera took a picture and then just zoomed the picture up so I used it like a microscope so it's about 50 percent 50 percent a few tablespoons of uh, water whatever it is to take it and seal them in a baggie and in about 10 days you'll start seeing germination going on <clears throat> here's a little seedling starting to come up I gave a bunch of these to um, to a, a member who lives in Nauvoo. His name is Richard Hancock, and Richard took and put them in the plastic bag and got them germinating and spread them over a tray because they're so small you can't hardly see them. But once he knew he, they were starting to germinate, he spread them over a tray of potting soil. And as you see, we got a really, really good germination we're getting almost 100 percent viability out of these seeds they're amazing the two bare spots are where he took those seedlings out and transplanted them into individual pots we've got about 2,000 of them growing now and what they're being used for is a program that's called the native native plant restoration program so they're growing them in the greenhouse there in Nauvoo and this spring we're going to bring them out and transplant them into several areas and bring a bunch of them back over and transplant them onto the temple site to get even more growing there <laughs> um, my brother-in-law Dana has got thousands of seeds and he's planting them in a greenhouse getting them going he's going to be planting them there in the Nephi area uh, we've got people in Oregon, uh, Arizona, uh, Idaho, uh, all over Kansas that are planting them. I, I'd love to send you some seeds if you want them and uh, all I ask is you send me some pictures of them as they're growing. We'd love to see if they grow well in your area. Uh, here's some of the young seedlings that are there in the greenhouse and here are the plants now after they've gotten a little bit bigger and here's some I'm growing up in my attic room in my house that I'll be planting in my yard <clears throat> I've got individual ones I've got some that I need to transplant so if you're in the Lawrence Kansas area give me a shout I'll be glad to give you some plants <clears throat> now here's the thing one of the things interesting this is the temple site again and right over here is a nursery where they grow thousands of plants and sell them for people that want plants to plant around their homes and so on and the man who runs the nursery heard my presentation because we used one of his greenhouses when we brought the magnetometer in from Germany by the way we found thousands of fire pits in the area that some of them are dating back to the time of the Book of Mormon again and <clears throat> we're still doing work on that collecting the charcoal samples and um, 
Anyway, there's a plant nursery right here. The man who lives there would drive up and down this road every time they want to go to the store or go into town or whatever. He said he'd never seen the plant before, and it's growing right here. And when I drove around this area, I never saw it growing anywhere else except the temple site. I believe that this is a plant that were used by the Nephites for malaria. If it's a strong antibiotic, they probably made a poultice out of it and put it on wounds that were they may have gotten in battle or however they acquired a wound, and it was a disinfectant. Um, one of our friends there, Sister Curly, took and chewed on one of the leaves. She'd had a root canal and she had a toothache. She chewed on the leaf for a minute, the toothache was gone. <clears throat> so it's very interesting what can be done with this. Now growing next to the spotted bee balm, I'm only going to put this one slide in, Enothera biannual, <clears throat> a common primrose, is also growing on the berm with the spotted bee balm. One person um, who who works in the herb who's an herbologist wrote if he had six plants that he could choose from for their medicinal value this plant would be one of them as one of the most powerful ones and this is also growing on the temple site there it is this is what it looks like it's evening primrose enothera biannuus common primrose so it's got medicinal values we're just starting to scratch the surface there's over, um, I'll show you in a minute, one of Dana's presentations, you can go to it. He's listed over, I think, 50 Native American tribes that are using the spotted bee balm for medicinal purposes. This is the talk, I'm rounding up here. This is the talk by Dana Clay Young. Um, his, the title of his is Ancient Plants, A Voice from the Past, Treasures to Come Forth. He's going to talk to you about the chemicals of it, and he's going to talk about what we're being re we're getting ready to introduce. He will be marketing this. Um, I'll talk a little more about that. The name of the oil, it's going to be a blend, is called Zeratime Essential Oil. And Dana can tell you more about it. He's been working for over a year on this blend. And um, why the blend in his, this is some of the stuff in his slides, why the blend, the location, the chemotypes, um, getting it to market fast, increasing the biological activities of the plant. So I'm not going to give his talk for you. You can go there and hear it, but he talks about the synergistic effect and some of the, it's worked for headaches and reducing fever and rheumatoid arthritis, you name it. Um, this is potentially the bottle that'll be sold in as a synergistic blend and I don't want to turn this into a commercial some people think oh you're just trying to get rich off this well Dana sells 112 different essential oils so when he adds their time he'll now be selling 113 different essential oils we're not looking at this as a big money maker but we are trying to uh, we're asking people to help us continue this work if you would like to donate to the cause um, and none of us are paid we don't get any salaries I'm not paid um, Wayne May, John Lefgren, all of the colleagues that are working on this, Mike Baker, uh, Jeff Green, um, the, um, I shouldn't have started naming names, but Betty and Mike LaFontaine, um, some of our friends out in, um, out, out on the East Coast, none of us are getting a salary. This is all a, a labor of love. But we can't bring in a $30,000 instrument to collect data if we don't have money. <clears throat> and so uh, you can go to this site, the Zarahemla site. Here's our Facebook page. Um, let me tell you what Dana is going to do. Dana is very much a Heartland uh, Book of Mormon person. He's excited about this work. Um, what he's going to do, he's given a link here. If you decide you do want to buy the, the oil, and, and I skipped over the blend real quick, but uh, you can click on this. Anyone who buys the oil or any other products, um, he will give, depending on whether you buy it wholesale or retail, he'll give 38 to 28% of the proceeds back to the Heartland Research Group as a donation to help us generate money so that we can bring in the equipment needed to do 
modern day archaeological work. We need to get some aerial photography. We need LIDAR data. <clears throat> we need um, the, the types of stuff with the magnetometer. We need to date, carbon date, the carbon samples we're getting out of the ground from the fire pits and all kinds of things like that. So any help we can get would be greatly appreciated. Here's a white paper that Dana and I and Wayne put together. You can click on that on Dana's page or copy that if you can and then um, you can get a 26 page paper on this plant so that will finish it up um, I want you to know that I believe we have found the plant that was used by the Nephites as described in Alma 4640 that was used to cure the fever I'm almost absolutely positive that that seasonal fever was malaria um, forgot to mention during the Civil War over one million of the soldiers in the Civil War were infected by malaria. It was common. They had to have some way to treat it or they would die. So <clears throat> the, the Nephites used a plant that cured malaria. This plant, spotted bee balm, will cure malaria. I've cited multiple papers on it, so you can do more of your own homework on it. But anyway, thank you very much. If you have questions, uh, feel free to give me a call. That's my cell phone number. Here's my email address. You see the Opie on there. When I was a kid, I looked like Ronnie Howard, so I got nicknamed Opie all the time. <coughs> um, I'm very approachable. Glad to talk to you. So feel free to give me a call. And uh, I'll end the presentation there. Thank you.